I bet as you're studying Isaiah that you are enjoying David Arthur as much as I enjoy listening to him. It's been so wonderful to have him step in and help teach Isaiah part two. You know, this is what it's all about. It doesn't focus on an individual. It focuses on the word of God. And you're going to be so blessed today to hear from David Arthur, the vice president of teaching and training at Precept. Is it okay to bug God in prayer? Is it okay to keep on asking him the same thing over and over and over again until he finally says, okay, okay, I'll answer your prayer? Is that somehow disrespectful or forbidden in Christian prayer? Actually, we're going to see today that it is not only not forbidden, but it is actually anticipated by God and expected of us to be diligent and persistent in our prayer. It's okay to bug God. text today is Isaiah chapter 62. We pick up in verse 6. Let's read it together. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his strong arm. I will never again give your grain as food for your enemies, nor will foreigners drink your new wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it will eat it and praise the Lord. And those who gather it will drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. All right, so we look at verse 6 and we see a description here of watchmen sitting up on the wall. Now, a watchman's job was very simple. What they were to do is they were to sit on the highest point of a city wall and they worked in shifts. They couldn't sleep. They couldn't read their books. They couldn't uh, play checkers with one another. They had to continually be looking out on the horizon. Now, they're not looking for sunsets or for deer or, or pretty bunnies walking along the field, but rather they were looking for enemies. And a watchman was to be intent on his job. He was to be focused on his piece of the horizon that was designated for him. And sitting up on the, up on the hill there, up on the top of this wall, the watchman's job was to shout if he saw trouble. And as soon as a watchman would voice would cry out and shout danger or enemy or stranger, the city would go on to alert. In other words, it was the watchman's job to alert the city to action. Here we have a similar description. Isaiah says, your watchman will never be silent. Let's look at it again. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 6. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. How long do they work for? Well, it says all day and all night they will never keep silent. He goes on to say, you who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest until he, in a sense, answers your request. He establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise. What do we have here? In desperate times, desperate situations, there are actions that are required that are not normal. In other words, in a desperate time, you, it, you will call for desperate actions. Desperate situations call for brave and bold and persistent and diligent acts. In Isaiah, he says, I've placed them on the wall and their job is to not give me, God Almighty, rest until I establish. There's a, a parable in Luke chapter 18 that describes this. Go look with me to Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. 
In Luke 18, it says this. Now, he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying, In a certain city, there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while, he was unwilling. But afterward, he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. Okay, when you're studying a parable, it's always important to look for the point. What is the point? And usually they will tell you in a parable. This time it comes at the very beginning. Verse 1. Jesus is telling them a parable, it says, to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. Just recently, I had a friend whose father-in-law was dying of terminal cancer, a very successful businessman. This man was, uh, had the whole world wrapped up. Uh, he, had, he had achieved every financial success. He had multiple homes and had a beautiful, healthy family that loved him. And yet there on his deathbed, being stricken with cancer, he was going to hell. He was going to lose it all. And for months and months... My friend prayed for his father-in-law and he prayed, God, would you get his attention? And even though he was, he was struck with cancer and he was dying, he was granting wishes. He said to all his family, you can ask me for anything, any kind of wish, and I will grant it before I go. And so some would ask for a fishing trip. Some would ask, you know, for a, a vehicle or, or some kind of gift. But my friend said to his father-in-law, this is what I want. I want a chance to sit down with you and tell you why I have hope for eternity. Tell you about my relationship with Jesus Christ. Before this, he had snuffed him off and would never let him discuss this topic of salvation with him. But because he had offered this wish-granting deal, he said, okay, I'll do it. And there on his deathbed, he heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. He heard how God can save you. And he had been praying and praying and praying. And he had said before this day, Lord, am I to continue to pray? It seems as if you are not answering our prayers. But he kept on praying. He had me and some other friends praying for him. And there on his deathbed, in the oxygen mask, he cried out to God for salvation. My friend's father-in-law went from the kingdom of darkness and to the kingdom of light. This parable tells us that we are to not lose heart in praying. We are not to give up, but that at all times that we should pray. In Isaiah, he says the watchman's job up on the wall is to not give me rest, but rather to be persistent in their calling out to him. You know, this is a sense in which we get this idea of preservation, of persevering, of sticking to it, of not saying, okay, I've already tried. He's not going to answer me, so I'm going to move on. I want to show you another one in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, we'll look at verses 15 and 16. Here, Paul writing to Timothy, and he's reminding him of the gifts and the calling that God has placed upon his life. And he tells them, I want you to prescribe and I want you to teach these things in verse 11. And, and don't give up and don't let those look down on your youthfulness. But until I come, I want you to give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. He then says this in verse 15. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, as for as you do this, you will ensure salvation, both for yourself and for those who hear you. I've underlined them in my Bible because they mean so much to me. These verbs in verse 15, take pains with these things. 
What's implied with that? It means that there's going to be struggle. There's going to, it's going to take time for some things. That God is not a slot machine that we simply you know, place a coin in and pull the lever and we get what we want. But for some reason, God has designed our relationship with Him that we are to, um, we're to connect with Him in a sense of, of a begging and a pleading. And it's not as if God has got His arms folded back and He enjoys somehow watching us struggle, but that He wants us to engage Him in our requests. He's calling us in a relationship to seek Him. Look what it says. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them. It's interesting. He goes on to say that as you pay close attention to these things, as you take pains, as you immerse and be absorbed and and soak in these truths, he says, this is what you will achieve. It's a promise. Verse 16. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation, both for yourself and for those who hear you. Paul ended his life as a martyr. The apostle Paul was uh, supposedly crucified, much in the way that Jesus was. Uh, Paul ended his life uh, following Jesus, and he turns to Timothy in his final statements and says, follow me. Do the same thing. My friend, is your relationship with God more like a grocery list where you simply list down the things you want and then you hand it to Him? Or is your relationship one that is dynamic? Is it one in which you are like the watchman of the wall, crying out, not giving God rest? Is it really okay to bug Him like that? Is it some sign of disrespect when we persistently ask Him? Absolutely not. Jesus tells us in Luke 18 that we are to not lose heart, that we're to not give up that we are to pursue Him in in persistent prayer and that we are to give Him our hearts in prayer. We are to beg Him and to not give Him rest until He answers us. My friend, it's okay to bug God in prayer. continue our study in Isaiah 62 and we're now beginning to pick up in verse 10 and we're going to see this idea of a highway. Let's look at verse 10. Go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift up a standard over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, lo, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you will be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Here we have some more ideas about how God renames them. But there's an image brought up in verse 10 that I want to draw your attention to. Look at verse 10. Go through, go through the gates, he says, Clear the way for the people. Then here comes the image. Build up, build up a highway. Now, I've actually been in this part of the world a couple of times, and uh, there's not much flat, uh, smooth spaces uh, until you get way out into the desert. But most of it is, is kind of cut through with these things called wadis. They're like riverbeds that are etched their way through the rock. And so the road, the, the terrain in Israel is this rough up and down, uh, filled with um, uh, cracks and, and crevices and such. Uh, and so when we see this build up a highway, you, you literally get the idea of making a smooth way. I want to show you a couple of places Isaiah uses it. We'll pick up in Isaiah chapter 11. I want you to look at verse 16. Here is described a return from exile. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant of his people who will be left just as there was for Israel in the day when they came up out of the land of Egypt. Here we have a description of a return from exile. A return from exile is an indication for the people of God that forgiveness has been granted. 
God had made it very clear in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 that His punishment would be ultimately to send His people into exile. But with every punishment that He gave, there was always a way out. Grace. He said, if you will return to me, I will bring you back out of exile and put you back in your land. In verse 16, that return from exile is actually the ones for Israel. And because look what it says in 16, there will be a highway from Assyria. Assyria is the nation that has taken Israel into captivity, the northern part of Israel into captivity. He says this highway will be the, for the remnant. Those who are faithful, those who are still there will be brought out of exile. And he gives us a comparison. Look at that comparison at the end of verse 16. Just as there was for Israel in the day that they came up out of the land of Egypt. Do you remember that imagery, that picture that was described uh, in, in Exodus as they came out? God had told Moses, I want you to go toe to toe with Pharaoh. This is the most powerful man in the earth at this time. And I want you to tell him, let my people go. You remember this? There was plagues he gave. There were signs that God used to soften uh, Pharaoh's heart to this request. And Pharaoh eventually let them go. And as the people of God left Egypt, the Bible tells us that Egyptians began to give them gifts on the way out. These gifts of gold and, and silver and of jewelry were eventually what God would use to, to build and to pay for His temple, to decorate His temple. It was a great event, and it's one of the most significant events in the life of Israel was the exodus out of Egypt. And God describes a return from exile in 11, verse 16. Let's look at another one. Go with me to chapter 19. We'll look at verse 23. Isaiah 19 verse 23 it says this in that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria and the Assyrians will come into Egypt and the Egyptians into Assyria and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians in that day Israel will be the third party with Egypt and Assyria a blessing in the midst of the earth whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. A couple of other references we could look at in chapter 35, verse 5, or in chapter 49, verse 11. But the imagery is the same and consistent throughout Isaiah. This highway, when God says build a highway, it includes or it pervades the idea that God is going to bring His people back. He's going to restore them from exile. It's a great picture. It's a great picture of salvation. It's a great picture of God uh, restoring His people. But let's go back to Isaiah chapter 62. We pick up again uh, in Isaiah 62 in verse 11. It says, Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, Say to the daughter of Zion, Lo, your salvation comes. Behold, His reward is with him and his recompense uh, before him. And they are given a new name. They're called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. They're called a city sought out that is not forsaken. What is this reward that we, are so, or we see in verse 11? Behold, his reward is with him. I want to take you to the New Testament. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is the, the hall of faith. It describes uh, the men and women who came before us who live by faith. And in Hebrews 11, verse 6, we read this. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. In other words, if we're going to trust God, we must not just simply, yes, I believe in God. Yes, I believe there's a higher power. Yes, I believe there's something bigger and better than me out there. That is not what brings salvation. The Bible says it requires faith. And faith is the assurance of things hoped for but not yet seen. 
And he says part of that faith in verse 6 is we must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. In other words, God is one who will bring a reward. Then finally, I want to show you at the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. This is prophecy, much like Isaiah is, except for us, this is in our future as New Testament believers. Revelation chapter 2, 22, verse 12. Jesus says, Behold, I am coming quickly. And then look what he says next. And my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Here we have God described in our future. When he comes back, when Jesus comes back for his second coming, he will come and he will bring with him his reward. He brings a reward, and it's according to the things that we have done. We're told in Isaiah 62 that this is what God is like, that when He comes, He will be one who brings His reward with Him. Say to the daughter of Zion, it says in verse 11, that, Lo, your salvation comes. Behold, His reward is with Him and His recompense before Him. Let me ask you. Are you ready for his return? What reward will he bring you for the deeds that you have done in his name and by his power? Are you ready for him to come? Will he be able to say to you, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Will you be able to lay before him those things of which you have done in his power and for his kingdom and for his glory, that he might be a rewarder? Will you be on that highway that takes you from the exile of this world into the heavens of heavens to be with Him. God describes His rescue of His people in the form of a highway taking a rough, rugged terrain and lifting up and building a highway of return to Him. That's the way God describes it in Isaiah chapter 62. He says, build up, build up a highway for lo, my salvation comes. When I was 18 years old, I was in Eastern Europe and I was smuggling Bibles. This was during the communism time. And I found myself in the middle of Romania by myself, 18 years old, doing this task. There wasn't a flat road in the whole country. Communism had had its way with this land. It had tore it up. There were potholes everywhere. Literally, I would drive ducking and swerving these blemishes all throughout the road. I never found a freeway in the entire country. On my way out, though, as I had delivered the Bibles, as I had done the mission uh, that I was called to do, and I was on my way back home, back home to safety, I came into Yugoslavia, and I came through that country, and as I came into the country of Austria, I found myself on a four-lane autobahn. The autobahn is famous around the world. It is some of the best highway in the whole world, and you can go as fast as your car will take you on this road. And I remember reflecting, thinking back of the days that I had spent the past 10 days in this torn country filled with potholes, both literally on the road and spiritually in the community. There was trouble and anxiety and fear all over that country. A darkness had landed and stayed in that country and the word of God was just beginning to spread its light. As I had delivered the word of God, the light to them, as I had done that task and I was now coming back, I could feel the road lift up underneath me. And my heavenly father, in some sense, was carrying me back to home. God describes a return from exile in Isaiah 62 as a highway, an autobahn, you may say, a land that he is calling us to, that he will deliver us on this smooth highway. He says, build it up. For lo, my salvation comes. But that return from exile 
requires forgiveness and repentance. God says, if you will come to me, I will bring you in. Take on my yoke. It is light and it is easy. Come to me, he says, with open arms, for I have built up a highway of return from exile. This is an offer that God makes for his people, a generous offer. It's an offer of salvation, an offer for you and for me. Thank you for watching today. To order your copy of today's program, log on to our website at preceptsforlife.com. To download your free copy of the study guide or to find out more about Precept Ministries International, click on our website or call us today at 1-800-763-1990. Join us for our next program as we discover more Precepts for Life. God says, if you will come to me, I will bring you in. Take on my yoke. It is light and it is easy. Come to me, he says, with open arms, for I have built up a highway of return from exile. This is an offer that God makes for his people. Join us for our next program as we discover more Precepts for Life.